join me in welcoming Dave Goldman to the stage. Okay, hello everybody. So uh, today I wanted to first start by saying thanks to Ori, to Tom, uh, to Molly for setting this up because I've been thinking for a long time Israel is a center of excellence when it comes to all technologies XR related. Oops, thanks. Um, and so it's really good that we get this off to a good start. And I want to talk about, I want to talk about um, the state of smart glasses today, some of the challenges that we have on the hardware side. And specifically, I want to focus on optics, since that's Loomis's, um, you know, that's our tough key, that's our role here. We are a optics company. We build the transparent displays that actually are currently being used in um, HMDs and smart glasses, as well as are going to be used in future consumer products <clears throat> that come to the market. So first, we're going to talk about the dream, uh, what everybody wants. Then we're going to look at the reality. We're going to talk a little bit about how hardware is hard. Um, the landscape, and I want to do this by looking at various optic solutions. And then finally, we're going to talk about the race to the consumer market. So what does everybody want? I think everybody knows what everybody wants. Um, we want what I'm wearing. We want a pair of Ray-Bans. Uh, it has to have a very big field of view, which is your active area. It has to be completely transparent. It has to offer high performance in, ter in terms of the clarity of the picture. And we also want image uniformity and we want long battery life. So it's a long laundry list of wants. Um, but I like to call this HR. The reality is, and Carl Gutag, who's an industry blogger, you guys should all follow him, um, he says this. He says, every tier one company starts off with the Ray-Ban Wayfarer glasses and ends up with the HoloLens. By the time you add in all the sensors, the slam tracking, you know, the, the extra cameras, what you're looking at is something that is heavier and bulkier than what you started out with. <clears throat> and there's a reason for that. There was about five minutes where the tier ones talked about pulling back on the field of view. Um, but since the Magic Leap 1 came out, we see that they're, they're back to, and it's 50 degree field of view, and they say it's not big enough. They're back to pursuing a very high field of view, which is a key parameter. So um, there's unfortunately no Moore's Law when it comes to optics. We're working against physics. Uh, you know, it's not like we can be iterative every, every two months and come out with a new product. We're working against, uh, in some cases, some serious obstacles. Um, because of the strict NDAs that we have with the companies that are building smart glasses and perhaps using our optics, I can't tell you specifically any plans that they have, but I can tell you they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on optics before reali realizing that they hit a brick wall and then they needed to change their course. So, by the way, did anybody see the movie A Beautiful Mind? No? Well, anyway, this is what it looks like inside every one of our uh, optics developers' uh, offices on the whiteboard. This stuff is hard. It's not, uh, it's not simple. What's challenging about smart glasses is that you need to actually get a display that comes from someplace either above or from the side of your eye into the eye, and it needs to have a high performance, bright color, transparent, a wide field of view, and all of this has to be within a compact form factor that you would actually feel comfortable and want to wear on your face. So that's not a trivial challenge. You've probably seen some version of this slide before, but what I think is really key is the use case sort of dictates the hardware as well. When we're talking about the enterprise, we're talking about ease of use. Um, we, want, we want to be able to wear our glasses and wear something like the HoloLens over them. So it's not as concerned about the form factor. But when we talk about the consumer, what we're looking at is um, somebody once said, the face is sacred space. So it's not just a mechanical challenge and it's not just a software challenge, it's a fashion challenge. And that's not simple. So if we map some of the um, you know, devices to some of the, the previous continuum that we saw, we're all familiar with AR Kit and AR Core, and then you sort of have what I like to call assisted reality. This is Google Glass, this is uh, Focals, which just recently announced from what was formerly uh, Thalmic Labs. Um, Music's Blade, 
so there you have actually something that approaches a wearable in terms of you might want to wear it um, technology, but the trade-off is on the field of view. And the trade-off is it doesn't have all the immersiveness that you really want in terms of a you know, more complete AR experience. Then we have um, like the Mira Prism, which is an inexpensive version of AR, which I'm very optimistic. I hope a lot of people will develop on that at least and get used to it. Um, but um, you know, again, not something you would ever see on the streets of Tel Aviv or San Francisco. And then finally, we have mixed reality, which is the HoloLens and the Magic Leap, um, both of which are using waveguide optics, which we're going to talk about later. And if there's time, I'll take some questions. But um, configuration very much matters. A lot of people were skeptical about the Magic Leap 1 and the fact that they were going to offload some of the processing and some of the um, computing power and battery to the pocket. But it turns out we have one at our office. It's really comfortable. Um, the experience is great. In fact, um, if anyone's tried Angry Birds, that was the first time I really wanted to put back on a pair of uh, smart glasses. So I think they did a, a really good job there. Um, so there are different creative ways that we can actually lighten the load on the face and you'll, you'll be seeing some of those from some tier one companies in the coming years. But if we look at a teardown, and I want to thank iFixit for this, you've got on the left side, you've got the HoloLens, and then you've got the Magic Leap. Um, obviously, you can see that the optics really does dictate the hardware. So when a tier one company comes to a company like Loomis, they're usually starting from scratch. This is where they start from. They start with the optics, where the digital um, content is going to meet the physical reality. And then they build around there. And so a limiting factor is really the bulk and the size and the weight of the optics. And really, the transparent displays are the only um, AR-specific component that you'll find in a pair of AR glasses. Um, everything else is a commodity, the commodity that you would find in a, um, in a smartphone, in a monitor, in, any, in all other manner of technology. But the, the transparent displays are really where the rubber hits the ground. So let's take a look at a few AR optics um, options, and then we'll also be, some of us will be familiar with the form factor of these. So first of all, you have your conventional beam splitter. This is what Google Glass used. Uh, it is really probably the smallest hardware footprint, um, probably the least expensive to produce, but the performance isn't as meaningful as most people want, and the field of view is extremely limited. And this actually, this uh, begs, um, the, there's, a, there's sort of a, a difficult trade-off, which is the larger the field of view that you get, the larger the prism that has to sit above your eye is. So that also is a problem when it comes to, um, you know, to whether someone really wants to wear this. Next we have something called bird bath optics. And this is, it's almost like a HUD that sits in front of your eye. Um, this is ODG. This is, um, if anyone's tried the Lenovo, Disney, Star Wars, um, IMI. Out of Asia, we have uh, Mad Gaze and Third Eye. And they're using the bird bath optics, which is, Again, I mean, it, it's, it's an improvement, but it actually, it, it's still bulky. It's still not something that we think is consumer friendly. <clears throat> and then we have projected surface. I know uh, Meta is here, um, Real Max, the Mirror Prism, and Dreamworld. So this, this has actually got a lot of advantages in terms of the expense of the optics in particular. And maybe this is going to be great for an office worker application, but I think we can all agree it's probably not going to be um, a consumer product. And finally, we have waveguide optics. That's actually what Loomis does, and there, there are a lot of other companies that focus on, on waveguide optics. This is the most lightweight, um, the most transparent, and the smallest hardware footprint that you can have. Um, this is what the HoloLens is using. This is what uh, Magic Leap is using, um, Vuzix Blade. So we've got a lot of examples of diffractive waveguides. And the key advantages are, again, the hardware footprint, the transparency and also the fact that it's a it's actually a very mature technology um, Loomis for example uses solid state materials to do its reflective waveguide and this has been in the market for um, 100 years actually so 
I just want to show you what progress looks like. It doesn't ever go as fast as we hope it does, um, but it is incremental, and this is what we focus on. The DK50, which you see over there, it has these, um, you know, it has some protrusions on the side. Um, what we've done with our next version, which we're going to be announcing at CES, you're getting a sneak preview of it, is we've actually removed that and increased the peripheral view and increased the field of view that you have, the window to the world. So on the, um, on the optical engine level, what you have, you can see that there's a much greater geometry um, on the top version. That's the OE50, that's the old optical engine. And this is our new optical engine, the OE Sleek, which again, our goal is always to not compromise on the field of view, uh, to either increase it or to maintain it, but always trying to minimize the size of the pod projector. Um, it looks like we will probably have some time for some Q&A, but I want to at least leave you with a, a use case that's going on right now in San Francisco. The Menlo Fire Department is using Loomis Optics to actually see through smoke. Um, so uh, I'm going to actually play that, and then I'll take some questions. anyone has any uh, questions, I'm happy to take them at the time, or looks like I saved you some time. Tom? <laughs> any questions? Let's bring up Slido. Anything? Could a camera preserving the real world and a normal, a normal on eye screen can be a better solution than the see-through screen your glasses has? Um, I don't know if you're talking about pass-through uh, VR, but yeah, I mean, certainly there are companies that are doing this. I think they, they call themselves mixed reality. Um, and in some cases, for example, I know uh, tanks are using that technology and they don't even have to actually have any exposure to the world. But when it comes to a consumer product, um, you know, you still don't have quite the same situational awareness that you would have with transparent displays. Uh, what are the costs? Right. So obviously this is, uh, you know, this has to do with the volume. Um, I think we're all seeing that the, the big numbers are at least three years away when we're going to be able to drive down costs. But I know Loomis and some of the other waveguide companies have partnered with Taiwanese ODMs. Um, in our case, we've partnered with Quanta. And that they've actually built a production facility to mass produce in the millions our optics. So when you know, the consumer market is ready, we're going to have a very aggressive price point. What field of view do you expect in 2019? Um, so I assume, I mean, I can speak for, for Loomis specifically, I can't really speak for any other company. I mean, right now we have among the highest field of view. Uh, we have uh, 40, we've achieved as high as 55 degrees. That is without any cheating on the sides, like that's 100% overlap. Um, and we're actually going to be pushing past 55 in 2019, so hopefully somewhere around 60, 60 degrees. What temperature range do they operate in? Ah, oh, that's maybe not a question that I can answer. I mean, I can tell you that Quake Technologies used our um, optics, um, but it's protected by the firefighter and first responder mask. So um, there are certain tolerances. Um, I'd have to probably get back to you on that. So approach me afterwards at our booth. Um, go, does it work with people? who already wear glasses. Ah, so there are actually two solutions to prescription. We've worked with a company called Essilor, you might have heard of, they're the largest lens company in the world, uh, to have an RX version, eventually, of our optics. Um, in addition, you know, right now, if you come to our booth, we have clip-ins that, that function for um, most prescription numbers, not stigmatisms. 
Um, so, um, but we, you know, that's a famous question is, uh, you know, I just had LASIK surgery. Why do I want to wear glasses now? And the answer to that question is, if you offer enough value, then we, we presume even people that have had corrective surgery will want to wear AR glasses. What exactly limits the field of view overall in smart glasses? Um, <clears throat> well, it depends on the, again, it depends on the optic solution. If you're talking about a really, really small optics like what you see in Google Glass, so again, you could, in theory, you could have a 50 degree field of view, but you'd have something resembling a Rubik's Cube over your eye. If you're using waveguide optics, where we've actually sort of sliced that prism and angled it inside the lens, it's a 1.6 millimeters thin, and um, you know you can you know there are, there aren't really there aren't I mean it's a challenge, but there aren't really um, limits in terms of field of view for us beyond you know um, I would say form factor challenges. You know you do have to increase the size of the pod when you usually have a larger field of view. What are the challenges to make a full field of view? Um, yeah, so. When it comes to a full field of view, I think there are a couple ways of looking at this. If you look at something like the hollow lens, which fits over your glasses, the advantage is that you have full periphery, per, peripheral vision, right? Even if you're not overlaying digital content, you have this openness and this immersive feeling. When you build a glasses form factor where the projection is coming you know, from the side, inevitably you have a trade-off, which is that some of your peripheral vision is going to be cut off. So I think when we're talking about our window to the world, that's, you know, it's, it's in some ways easier to do a top-down approach uh, to create a more immersive experience. What about the light field technology claimed by Magic Leap? So I'm pretty sure light field technology with regard to Magic Leap, although I'm not, you know, they're here, I'll let them speak for themselves, has to do more with their, the fact that they're attacking the multifocal challenge, which is um, something called vergence accommodations conflict. It has to do with, you know, your ability to keep things in focus the way the natural eye works. So if I put my finger, you know, in front of me, everybody out, out here is out of focus, but my finger's in focus. And likewise, if I look at you, then my finger becomes out of focus. Now, Magic Leap does have have a solution for that, um, and I'm pretty sure that's what they mean because as far as what we see from the teardown, they're using diffractive waveguides. Um, another thing about diffractive waveguides that's different than the reflective waveguides of Loomis is um, they actually have to have separate waveguides for each um, color. So red, green, blue. Um, when it comes to our technology, it's really, um, it's reflective technology. So you're taking the image, you don't have to break up the colors and reassemble them. It's, uh, in a way, it's a, a little bit more of an efficient uh, architecture. When will we see the dream Ray-Bans? Ah. I wish I knew the question, uh, the answer to that question. Um, I think that we, here's how I look at it. I'm very, very bullish on consumer uh, AR glasses. Um, I'm not one of these people that thinks in three years we're going to replace our cell phone with them. I think what you're going to see is you're going to use the processing power of your phone and it's almost going to be like a peripheral. You'll wear the glasses and it'll be either an extension of your display or a replacement of the display of your cell phone. Because I think we're all pretty tired of just having, you know, the little black mirror to operate from. So uh, I would say before you see millions of Ray-Ban-like devices, it wouldn't be before 10 years. That's according to me. Uh, that's, I don't know. Uh, we'd have to take a vote. Does outdoor use work with your technology? Yes. Um, that's one of the actually differentiations between Loomis and some of the other optics companies. We have probably the brightest image. Um, our technology was originally developed for fighter pilots for whom it's always a sunny day above the clouds. So we have, we, we use a very, very bright image, I think up to 9,000 nits. And, um, and so that means that we're daylight readable. You can take our stuff outside as uh, several in the industry have, and you can actually get a very, very good quality experience. In three years, who do you think will be the primary Loomis users? In three years, I would say it would probably still be, it would be a balance somewhere between enterprise. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Daiquiri. They already use our optics. Um, so you have the industrial uh, side. And then we're going to start seeing consumer devices that use our, um, I can't exactly say more about that, but I think that within three years, you'll probably have a million units that are using Lumis optics. Oh, that's it. Okay, time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you.